Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I got a, I got no conversation for you this week. The um, the injury I'm dealing with has just made it too tough for me to to scramble and put together a real episode. Plus, I've got like six or seven shows potentially going into the four weeks of March, so it'll all balance out. I recorded next week's already, so it's a good one. You'll dig that. But this time around, you uh, get a little trip down virtual memories lane, which... Yeah, I guess you could say makes this a, a conversation with myself and 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 maybe the rest of the world. You decide at the end. It's uh, Sunday morning, February 25th, 2024. Last Thursday, Amy and I went to the movies. It was my first time in a movie theater since 2018, except for a comics festival event last fall, but that's a different sort of thing. And uh, that may seem like a long time, and it is. It was also a uh, date night, which uh, it's been a long time since we had one of those, too. And we went out to see Perfect Days, this new movie by Vim Vendors. It is, it's about Hirayama, a man who cleans high-end public toilets in Tokyo. Um, we see his, his workday routine, his diligence at his job, his his deference when someone needs to use a, a bathroom that he's cleaning, his uh, silent exasperation at his young shift partner, um, his collection of, of rock cassette tapes that he listens to in his, his little van, um, his lunchtime in a park, his analog film hobby, uh, his, his little life. And his adjustments when, when things go awry. I mean, we, we see the routines, but we also see how flexible he, he can be when things get weird. It's, it's really a magical movie. And it's not simply a, you know, man finds Zen and acceptance of menial work or, um, or an inscrutable Japanese thing. Um, Hirayama is a, a man with complications and frustrations and he wears those on his face and and you could maybe say he's you know quote unquote meant for for better things but this is who he is who we see over well um a bunch of days of, of his life and the actor uh Koji Akusho uh who who wrote it is just beautiful to look at um older guy just a face filled with character and a lot of the movie is wordless so you you spend time just exploring his face but the thing is beyond the experience of the movie itself throughout the the whole two hours i kept thinking of how it had been four years since amy and i had, had been to japan um as guests of one of the members of my my trade association they brought us over for a week so that i could uh, visit their facility and and see some other Japanese pharma companies and 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 speak to a trade association there like the the Japanese version of the the one that I built here in the U.S. and we joked that they brought Amy along as our official photographer but she had her days free while I was off on business. The trip started in Tokyo and then uh, we also went on to Osaka and Kyoto before returning to Tokyo and we had a, a free day to ourselves at the end. And our hosts, they were wonderful. They they took us to see the the sites, you know, in our downtime, like the the Golden Temple and and Osaka's Shinto Shrine. Um, one night, actually, they took us to this impossibly out of the way place for this this Matsusaka beef dinner. Um, I literally don't know how far we drove that night. I have no record of where we went. All I know is. 
It went on for a long time. We just kept driving and driving and driving at the end of a pretty tiring work day. And Amy and I were getting a little delirious from hunger by the time we arrived. But it turned out to be one of the greatest meals of our lives. Um, there's no photographic evidence of it. I, I could probably ask the, the company where they took us, but but it was magic. And I said it was it was four years since that trip, and I mentioned what today is. Um, not all you guys listen to this in real time. I mean, it was February 2020, like just before the end of the world. And I mean, when we visited the Golden Temple in Kyoto, our hosts were agog because the the main parking lot was almost empty. And Chinese tourists were already barred from, from traveling. Otherwise, the place would have been filled with buses of uh, of Chinese tourists. Um, and during our stay, like the, they announced the Tokyo Marathon was closed. Uh, they were going to only have the top 200 runners. There were going to be no spectators. They were worried, uh, they were worried about the, the Summer Olympics for, for 2020. And that was sort of the backdrop. And in fact, on Amy's first day on her own, um, she said that people on the subway just moved away from her because she wasn't wearing a mask. Um, and our, our host gave us a pack of them on, on day two, which we made good use of. But this isn't about COVID exactly, except when it is. It's not a travelogue either, because I'd leave so much out. It's It's really about the places we don't go and the moments that we lose, I think. It's about memory. It's about virtual memories. Perfect Days is um, it's set in the, the Shibuya district of, of Tokyo. And I, I don't think we went there during our stay. I mean, yeah, you know, I tried reconstructing some stuff after I look at the map and it's not clear. It's not near my, my client's uh, Tokyo business office um, or the hotels we stayed in or, or the neighborhoods we visited on our, our own, um, like the one with the, the Owl Cafe and, and the area where they use bookstores and 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 the Uniqlo flagship where I, I bought an anorak and again, not a travelogue. Um, yesterday morning I was reading my, my daily two pages of Emily Dickinson's poems, uh, which I know sounds pretentious, but whatever. Um, along with my daily reread of the previous two pages, because I never understand them in the moment. And I thought while I was going through this, this post-perfect day's reverie that I've seen so much more of the world than she did. I wanted to say than she could have imagined, but but her imagination was boundless. I mean, even in her hometown, uh, in, in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, I saw something she never did, uh, her, her grave, back in 2022 after, uh, after another podcast. Of course, like half her poems are about her dying, so I'm, I'm pretty sure she imagined her resting place, too. But Japan, man, what would that have meant to her? Not even like the, the present moment of Japan, but, you know, what it was back in the 1860s, 70s. It was just a symbol. What did it mean to me? I mean, to be on the other side of the world just when the world was tilting off its axis and seeing a place that was like home, but so different. And I actually started thinking about Japan before going to perfect days. It's because I was reading a biography of Keith Haring, which will be the subject of next week's podcast that I, I recorded with Brad Gooch. Um, and reading it reminded me of a funny moment from the trip. See, before we left for Japan, um, you got to bring gifts, right? You, you know, Amy had some stuff she'd put together, uh, uh, one of her cookbooks that she did the photography for, uh, some high-end chocolates. Uh, I picked up some other little gifts I figured would, would make sense. So in, in Grand Central in New York City, I saw some neat little bagus, you know, the, those bags that you kind of fold up in uh, the reusable plastic bags. You fold them up, you put them in a, a little little plastic bag of their own. Um, 
And these ones had these these Keith Haring designs on them, and the graphics are really New York centric. And I thought that would be a nice little you know handout for for people, you know, nothing extravagant, but you know, if the need arose. So I took those with us, and the last day of the first Tokyo stop before we hit Kyoto and Osaka. We visited the Japanese parent company of one of my U.S. members, and the American branch is really small, but in Japan, the business is huge, and they had this wonderful office overlooking the Tokyo Bay, and they were pointing out some of the construction for the 2020 Olympics and all this other stuff. It was it was fantastic. Um, but when we entered the lobby going in, I saw these Keith Haring prints all over the place. So I asked my, my liaison about it. What's the deal? And he said, oh, the, the owner and his wife have the biggest collection of Keith Haring art in the world. And they, they built their own museum, you know, dedicated to him. Then he pointed to this display nearby that had a brochure for a Haring exhibition that just opened at the museum a, a month before. And I just plotzed. I mean, you know, I grabbed a brochure. I, I cursed my luck over leaving those those little bagus back in my suitcase at the hotel all I had with me was like in my little little uh you know briefcase uh, of of work stuff um but after the meeting you know I met with the president the wife of the I think he's the CEO and owner uh, his wife is president I said to her can you send someone by the hotel we're staying in uh, we're checking out right after this and traveling but I have a gift for you and your husband that I kind of forgot to bring um and once we got back there. I, I got a nice gift bag. I put the three herring bagus in them. I, I wrote a nice note, left them at the front desk. And she sent someone to pick them up and sent me this lovely note afterwards. Um, but I mean, I was just totally puzzled. Like, why Why did Keith Herring mean so much to a couple of business people in Japan? How would they have known about him from, from back then? I guess I didn't really get, you know... Um, Get the worldwide appeal of of Keith Haring, and especially until I read Brad's biography last week, and discovered the impact that that Haring had on Tokyo, and and the impact Tokyo had on him back in the eighties. I, I just didn't know. Didn't know his father was a Marine who served in Japan, and and that was part of Keith's childhood. Just just having all these, well, having chopsticks and art and things like that around him growing up in Cuts Down, Pennsylvania. Uh, Brad laughed when I, I told him the whole story before we started recording. And I I brought that flyer, that brochure for the exhibition with me to show him. Um, and it's this, this gatefold. Uh, basically folds in. The, the left side is Japanese, right side is English. And then it opens out. And, and when you open it out, it reveals uh, a triptych that Herring did, one of the last pieces he ever made. And Brad looked it over and he, he plotzed and, and asked if he could hold on to it. And I just felt the stabbing in my chest. And I said, no, but I'll scan it and send it over. See, I have this um, this envelope, uh, business envelope, you know, like one of those, those big, you know, larger than letter size things. Uh, it's sitting on a, a book cart here in my office, library, home. And it's from... Um, one of the companies we visited during the, the trip, a medical products maker named Nipro. And the envelope is filled with with their literature, hotel bills, cafe receipts, that, that herring brochure, and all the other little little things from Japan from that week. And I I just <laughs> I couldn't give up that brochure to, to Brad. I, I felt terrible in that moment, but I, I couldn't believe he even asked me for it, but he didn't understand, you know, didn't understand what I'm telling you right now, I guess, about that trip. I mean, when I say this, this all isn't about COVID, I mean, of course it is. You know, we got home on, on February 23rd, 2020, which would be four years and two days ago. And the world as we knew it, you know, came to an end less than three weeks later. March 13th uh, for us. It was that Friday evening, Friday the 13th. Uh, we had our tax prep appointment with our accountant, um, went to the Whole Foods nearby his, his office right after that. It was almost abandoned and returned home for what would become a very, very long time. And every moment before then 
would come to mean so much more. And at some point during lockdown, a couple months in, I guess, one of us said to the other, you know, if we never get to travel again, we sure went out on a high note with this one. But that was the future. Um, for now, we're in Japan. Um, like I told you, my body is breaking down. Um, it's nothing new, but I'm in rough shape on and off. Pinch nerve in my neck has left me debilitated to a greater and lesser extent for uh, more than a month now. I think I aggravated it a few hours before the movie uh, on Thursday, but luckily for me, the theater seats are a lot more comfortable now than they, they were back when I used to go to the movies. Um, so I got by just fine over two hours of, of perfect days. It was the next day going into New York to, to record with Brad. And that wrecked me. Carrying my, my bag of recording gear, the two digital recorders, the mics, the mic stands, cables, couple of, of uh, power lines, things like that, um, along with Brad's 450-page hardcover, um, the strain just wiped me out. I did fine for the show itself. I could still rally, but I unraveled after. Uh, stupidly, I took a walk to a bookstore nearby because you know, it's me, um, instead of just getting on the subway, getting back to my car and, and going home. I'm hoping not to go anywhere today, uh, just rest. Even sitting here with headphones on for however long this takes, it'll, uh, it'll be a strain. And it looks like I'll be going back into the city on Wednesday for another another recording. Things I do for you, man. The thing was, I was breaking down then, back in Japan, too. But I brought running shoes with me. And I, I try to pack for maximum efficiency. I was going to go with one pair of shoes for this entire trip. Um, I could fake it with either, you know, casual slacks and such and the, the suits that I was wearing for the, the business meetings. But I brought running shoes. I hadn't run in months um, because I'd obviously, surprise, been overdoing it uh, in, in 2019. And I'd been in physical therapy and rehab for a bunch of knee and, and lower leg problems for a while, but I'd started feeling better. And, and I wanted to do something I'd probably never get the opportunity to do again. And that is run the 5k perimeter loop around the grounds of the, uh, the Imperial palace in Tokyo. Um, I did it on our, our last morning there. Our hotel was kind of nearby and I, I laced up at 6 a.m., stretched, kind of nervously walked slash jogged over to the, the nearest entrance of the, the, the palace grounds. The Otemon Gate is, is the one that was closest to us. I just looked it up on, on Google Maps before this and I ran, I ran for the first time since November of that year or that year before, uh, you run counterclockwise. I, I read that beforehand, uh, just as a things to do when you're going to run the uh, the Imperial Palace loop. Make sure you you go in that direction. Everybody else does. You don't want to run into someone. I guess I ran. It wasn't fast or anything by my standards. You may disagree. Um, according to my Garmin, there were nine minute miles. Uh, fastest I did was seven forty or so at one stretch. I felt it. Um, and almost no one was out at that hour. This is a Sunday morning. When I got back to the the Otemon gate, it's still closed uh, uh, then. I took a selfie. had my phone with me the whole time in case anything happened, which I don't normally do when I'm running, but, you know, when in Japan. Um, and the picture, you could see the gate and the stone wall in the background behind a moat. And I'm there sweating, and the light at that hour is gold, and it's illuminating the, the stone. And there's a 13-hour flight ahead of me, but it didn't matter. You know, whatever was coming, I, uh, I ran the palace loop. I might never be there again, and that's what I had to do. 
but there's a picture. Like I said, there's a picture from the run. There's an item in my my Garmin uh, uh, app's history. So four years later, I can look at the pace and the route and the weather that day and, and all that stuff. You know, it's a memory, but but it's offloaded, you know, the like like. Plato gets into, or Socrates gets into, in, in the Phaedrus, talking about you know the the what it meant to write things down and and offload memory. Um, in the movie, in, in Perfect Days, um, Hirayama drives around Tokyo's Shibuya district to clean these these amazing toilets there's really high-end incredible design and and you know one of them is one of those um oh i forget what you call it but basically it it looks transparent glass but when you push the button it, it polarizes and you can't see into the the bathrooms um it's the only american in the movie is a woman who when when hirayama is cleaning one of those she's she says to him excuse me how do you how do you work this because she does not want to be watched while while peeing, uh, and he just toggles a handle and shows her. But um, the movie doesn't say where he lives. We know that he has to drive to to get to Shibuya. We know he crosses the river. We know that he bicycles over the river afterwards in the the evenings. And maybe there are cues and clues that anyone in the know would would piece together pretty easily. But to me, it was it was just somewhere else. It was this nondescript neighborhood um the the big sky tree tower kind of looms over his place not immediately next to it but but it's always nearby and and it appears throughout the movie we we kind of see it punctuating every night oh it struck me about him in his little neighborhood and his his drives and his bicycle rides through through these places, past all these shops and, and businesses before he gets to the, you know, the ritzy areas where he cleans these, these toilets and the places where he goes out to his pub and the, the, the bathhouse he goes to after work uh, a couple of nights or a couple of evenings, um, where he rides on his day off, all that stuff. What struck me was how little of the every day I held on to from our trip, if you get me. I mean, we took pictures of all the, the, the great sites, you know, like I said, the, the um, Golden Temple, Shinto Shrine, Amy and I to uh, tooled around the, the Ginza on our last day. And I took pictures of the, the, the cityscape from these incredible hotel rooms we were in. And, and you know, I composed interesting shots of the, the skyscrapers from the ground level. And, and, and watching Perfect Days got me thinking about all the other stuff I didn't shoot. The things I didn't think were worth noticing or holding on to, I guess. To be fair to myself, I also had not started drawing at this point. It would take another year before I started doing that, and that's where I learned to see. Um, so maybe it would have been a different visit then. But, but in particular, like I thought about when my client took me to their Tokyo business office, like their their real facilities, their their pharma vial manufacturing and cleaning and an ampule area that's out in Kyoto. Um, but when they took me to their, their office in, in Tokyo, we drove through some pretty nondescript neighborhoods, nothing run down, just, you know, not the Ginza, not the big shopping area, but the, you know, businesses and, and apartments and things like that. And I remember, I remember streets without remembering them. Being in the movie reminded me of those places, those low buildings, those vending machines, the the, the bicycles, the people and their their lives. And Perfect Days brought that back to me and and we were walking through the mall afterwards. We saw the movie at Garden State Plaza, a mall where I've got more than 40 years of history. It could be a bunch of episodes in itself, my, my talking about malls of New Jersey and, and the transformation of Garden State. But as we were walking around, I told Amy, I wish I took pictures of all the ordinary stuff when we were over there, not, not just the wonders. 
I just wish there was more. Like, this will sound weird, but perfect days felt like someone else's memories of a place I had dreamed. And we kept walking past all these shops. She hadn't been to the mall in years. And we talked about what was gone, what was there, what didn't really look like it changed, but it changed. And I kept thinking about Hirayama and, and his life and all the questions we'll never have answers to, which is one of the great aspects of the movie. There are hints of things without ever having to tell you too much. And Amy reminded me of our visit to the Golden Temple. There's a, there's this, this area there where they have these vending machines that give you your fortune. And she remembered that I, I got a fortune while I was there. And she said, you know, it was a bad one. I remember maybe it was something or saying something about your, your diagnosis for you newbies. That would be the chronic lymphocytic leukemia diagnosis I got in the summer of 2021, about 16 months after all this. Um, I'm not one to believe in the predictive powers of vending machines. Um, but more to the point, I forgot what the fortune was. I, I said, I, I just don't remember. I'm going to have to go look it up in my photos when we get home tonight. I didn't. I, I checked on Friday morning instead. But there's no picture. There are pictures of that, that day and, and other stuff around the, the fortune vending machine, but uh, not a thing. Nothing about what it said. And Amy looked through her. She found a few of me actually, you know, putting a coin in the vending machine, I guess, and, and getting my fortune out and nothing about what it said. So I, I opened the analog desk. I took out my journal from that time, started eyeballing the, the pages from the trip. Same thing. No mention of the fortune. I did come across something that was just wonderful and sad, though. Or near the end of the trip, you were at lunch, me and Amy and, and my client who brought us out there, the boss, his number two and, uh, and a new person at the, the company. And the boss, he told us a story about him and his father and, and their shared love of country and Western music. Um, just not what we were expecting. He wasn't comfortable speaking English. He knows English. Um, he understood everything I said, just felt more at ease, uh, speaking in Japanese and then having someone translate. So one of his, the other staff or the American, uh, there, she, she translated. And like I said, she had just started at the company like a week or two before we arrived, um, in fact, I was helping kind of train her during the trip, kind of explaining some of the pharma terms to her so that she would know what they meant from Japan, uh, Japanese into English and such. And anyway, she was relaying the story to us from her boss, who, again, she had just met. And it was so sad in parts that she just started crying in the middle of it. And I'm not going to share it here. Um, maybe if we're hanging out sometime, I'll, I'll fill you in. I'll probably start crying just like, like Angie did that time. But it was, it was just beautiful for him to share something like this in a culture that stereotypically we see as, as so, or I assumed was so formal. He just gave this, this really important human moment to us. And it felt so close to him, to them. Um, it was something. Of course, me being me, my life being my life, it gave way to laughs shortly after because that was the the last lunch, last time we were going to spend together. They were going to put us on the train, send us back to Tokyo. We we're going to get a day on our own. Uh, so this was goodbye. So this is where we presented them with our gifts. Um, Amy broke out that cookbook. I broke out the chocolates. It was it was this great stuff. Um, unfortunately, as I reread that, that journal entry, it reminded me it turned into a low-key disaster. Um, 
The cookbook was called Moonshine. Uh, it's filled with recipes for drinks, and Amy did the photography for all these things. It turns out <laughs> our host is allergic to alcohol, the, the boss there. And he had a family tendency to diabetes, so the, the chocolates were a no-go, too. Um, so that was a little embarrassing, but his colleagues said they would make good use of it all. Uh, Amy said she would send a print of one of her photos for their office. She gave them a link to her site, said, pick whichever one you want. I will send you one of these. And and the boss said through Angie, she would have to come back someday to, to sign it. And... Um, There's this moment in Perfect Days when Hirayama is is talking to, to someone important in his life who wants to wants to know when they're gonna do something, and he, he tells her Kondo wa kondo ima wa ima. Next time is next time. Now is now. Uh, last fall, the my clients came over from Japan for the conference that I host in the U.S. They they planned some other business meetings around it, but they came for my my two day meeting in uh, in Maryland. And they took me aside at one point and asked if I I had a moment. And of course I I did. I'd always make time for them because they treated us to one of the most wonderful experiences I'd ever had. And uh, they had a gift. They had a gift for me and Amy. Um, and it was special and I won't tell you what it was, but then they said, uh, we have something else for you. <laughs> we remembered how much you loved all those Kit Kats we have in Japan. So we brought you some and it was this big bag filled with all of those crazy flavors of, of Kit Kats they have over there, all these bags of mini Kit Kats in I I wrote down the list because I've saved all of these these bags for now. Uh, milk tea, ice cream, strawberry, hazelnut, salt, lemon. Uh, one with a label that's only in Japanese, and the visual does not indicate what flavor it is, and I can't remember what it was. One that was the absolutely bizarre choice of sake flavored Kit Kat, and and our favorite. The, the one we discovered a, a day or so into the trip, Yuzu Matcha. Uh, I plotzed. Um, I, I thanked them profusely. I brought them home to Amy. And over the last couple of months, we've worked our way through almost all of them. I ate the last of these salt lemon ones yesterday. They were not that great, but they were special. Um, if you come over... There are still some of the uh, the sake ones left. You can you can have those. Um, well, like I was telling you about the fortune, the fortune Amy brought up back at Kyoto. I didn't take a picture of them. I didn't write down what it was, but I did take a picture around there of the metal trash can right by the vending machines and it's it's labeled in in harangana but it has an english translation above fortune dust can and i remembered i posted that on instagram so i thought maybe i, I posted the fortune as as you know part of the comment for that one there's no search of course so i had to scroll back through years of instagram entries on on friday morning just trying to Ignore all the time and effort that went into posting all of these images. And on my postcard a day, pictures were there and my art was there and all these other things. And I just kept scrolling, load more, scroll, load more, scroll, load more. I had to keep going down, down, down to, to 2020. And then I saw it, the, the fortune dust can. And I clicked through to, to see the caption, to see what I wrote that day. Maybe the fortune would be there, but it wasn't. All I wrote was, sometimes you have to throw your destiny in the garbage. That's all I have for you this week. I hope it's enough. If you can, go see Perfect Days. 
go see it in the theater. It's it's not a visual extravaganza or something, but it's it's worth just watching and just letting yourself go for a couple hours. And I'll see you next week. We'll talk about Keith Haring. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Music